All right, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the February, 6th of February, uh, not the 6th, it's the 3rd, isn't it? <laughs> February, I'm already it's wishing the, the, I'm already wishing the <laughs> Friday away. Welcome to this <laughs> non-farm payrolls webinar on Friday, the 3rd of February, uh, with me, Michael Hewson, and my colleague, Colin Szynski, um, where we will take you through doing? the non-farm payrolls number, the January non-farm payrolls report. And certainly I think expectations are fairly high while I work through the risk warnings. I think expectations are high that um, we will get a fairly decent number. Um, there's, I think there's a number of factors at play um, with, with respect to our thinking on this. And I know Colin and myself have basically laid out our thinking in our morning notes, which can be found on the news and analysis section of the CMC Markets website, we get we post them there. We will post them there every morning when we come in, just to sort of give you an indication of our thoughts for the day. So, just get rid of that risk warning. We're now ready to go. So, basically, looking at the last non-farm payrolls report of the Obama era. January and yes I know Donald Trump became president on the 20th of January but I think we can pretty much call it the last Obama payrolls report and uh, the big question is whether or not we're going to see I think the well, big question is that whether or not we're going to see a similar sort of bump in the official payrolls numbers that we saw in the ADP number and this is something that Colin and I would like to sort of kick around um, before the numbers this is a this is a spreadsheet of the ADP payrolls report and the non-farm payrolls report next to each other here and here. So obviously that's the January report earlier this week and then we had the December report and November but look how closely correlated they are to the non-farms on a month-to-month -month basis. There's never really that much of a difference between the two over the course of the last 12 months, apart from here in July when there was a 38,000 difference and um, here in March when there was um, a 30,000 difference. For the past 12 months we haven't really seen more than a 30,000 difference between the non-farm payrolls report and the ADP report. Now obviously that's not to say that this one will be similar but based on historical precedents and I'm big on those sorts of things being a technical analyst I look for patterns and the pattern here would appear to suggest that non-farm payrolls if the pattern is going to be repeated is going to be pretty close to the ADP number which is why I've gone fairly high at 210 from the consensus which is two, which is 180 Colin on the other hand doesn't appear to want to play um, things by halves. He's gone all in, haven't you, mate? I have. I've gone to uh, 225, which I actually consider... consider I, I actually split my calls between the revision and the headline number. I've gone for 225 for the headline number, plus I'm thinking a 20,000 upward revision to September, which is pretty much two, which is 245, or gives you the uh, pretty much in line with the, the ADP number. My thinking is that December was a little bit light, and, and the reason I, I felt that was that we had this huge amount of pent-up hiring demand following the, uh, or sorry, heading into the U.S. election. Some of that showed up in November where you could have people stepped in, started hiring right away, and then we had to drop off in December. And I think what happened, it happened was that some jobs you can fill fairly rapidly. You can just go out and hire somebody within a couple of weeks. And a certain number of jobs, sometimes the hiring process will take six weeks to two months, plus you had the two weeks of holidays in there. And I suspect that some of the hirings that you might normally, had, had we not had Christmas and well, had it not been December and it had been in the summer, say, or, or in the or in October or something, you would have had two months of strong hirings. But instead, because of the holidays, you went soft in December. And I think you made that back in, in the first couple of weeks of January where people went back off, the came back from the holidays ready to, um, to, um, to make their hiring decisions. And I think that's what's happened there. The other thing we're going to, Michael and I have been uh, kicking around this morning is, is the government hiring. There's a, and it doesn't matter, there, there's about 4,000 jobs that get that turnover during an inauguration month, and then of course Donald Trump. 
and then of course Donald Trump came in and also announced a hiring freeze. So government jobs could play a bit of a factor uh, in this month. We're not. We're, we were just debating before the call whether the. Uh, 4,000 people quitting their jobs and, and being replaced by 4,000 other people, does it really matter? Because it, 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 it's not really net, uh, net out to zero at the end. And do you get this where, where people leave and maybe they show up in the numbers and then they hire the, the next group of people get hired and they show up in the next month? Or how does that work? We're not totally sure. Again, it's about it's about four or 5,000 people that we're talking about anyway. Yeah, so it's not a particularly high number, but nonetheless, it could it could constitute a skew one way or the other. So, um, for for me, it's it, it's still a factor, just not a particularly large one. Certainly not when you're talking in the context of say, thirty thousand jobs, and then that's really what we're talking about in terms of differentials when we're talking about um, today's payroll today's payrolls report. Um, yeah, so I think it's really interesting, Michael, you've put up manufacturing payrolls there because it's something that I was thinking about but forgot to mention in my notes. So maybe you want, do you want to speak to that? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, we have, seen, we, we have seen a particularly big pickup on the ISM manufacturing component earlier this week. There was a big jump in jobs there. The big question is, will they get included in the January numbers or will they actually get rolled into the February? Because sometimes there isn't a decent correlation between the ISM and the actual official payrolls numbers. Um, sometimes there's a bit of a lag. And what I was struck by actually was how how there was such a big difference in terms of the Chicago PMI and the disappointing yes, number absolutely. that we saw there and the ISM manufacturing and the fairly decent number that we saw there. So certainly in terms of manufacturing I think that's going to be a fairly decent indicator as to whether or not we're going to um, we're going to get a, we're going to get a good number. One other thing that I did notice on the ADP payrolls number was the fact that of all those jobs that were added, 246,000, 201 of them were services jobs. So that's Still huge, that, yeah. which 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 is which which is quite big. Um, so you know, it sort of does beg the question: the quality of the jobs relative to. Um, okay. You know, you know, re relative to the the rise in wages. One other thing. I also uh, rig counts. Go ahead. Rig counts have risen yes, quite rig substantially. Counts. Now, yeah. Obviously, if rig counts have risen, that means the jobs that man those rigs have basically come back online. So, will that be? And those are good, high-paying jobs. Yeah. So that could feed through. Yeah, so that might be into wages to the average hourly earnings. Yeah. And I also wanted to note on the manufacturing. With all the talk we've had lately about uh, out of the out of the Trump administration about currencies, trade, tariffs, walls, you name it, it's all going to focus in on the big thing they're they're going to be trying to goose for the next several months is manufacturing payrolls. So that's another thing. If that comes in at, at a low number again, you'll probably hear some squawking out of the uh, out of the political side this morning. I think that's going to be a uh, an area that's uh, that's going to be particular. I get a lot of focus from Trump in the next while. There's quite a few people now on my Twitter timeline going quite high on NFP guesses, so oh, I, yeah. I've obviously set a trend. Now they're, in. now they're starting to kick in. <laughs> we, we've set a trend, mate. Um, we, we need to be careful about that. So let's. <laughs> yeah. let, so, so basically, the key the key numbers I'm looking for because I think the big question is for me is if this is a good number, what effect will it have on the dollar, given Peter Navarro's comments this week? And given Donald Trump's comments recently, it's quite apparent to me that the new administration does not want a stronger dollar. And agreed, Mr. Trump broke with convention by actually specifically saying that the strong dollar was was killing us, or, or, or was killing us. I mean, I think that was that was, that was the exact phraseology that he used. You know, and presidents don't normally aren't normally in the habit of talking about um, their currency. For the very the simple currency. reason, it's yeah. it's just not the done thing, whether it's weak or whether it's strong. So, for me, I think there's been a little bit of a sell-off in the dollar index as a result of that, and certainly the dollar is actually very strong today. If we look at this currency ranking today for um, all the currencies against the dollar, we can see that pretty much um, the biggest faller is the Swedish krona. Then it's followed by the pound. We'll cover the pound in a minute. I think there's a there's a good chance we could test 124.20 uh, later today. Well, that's a really really big level for me on the cable. Um, but again, mm -hmm. also also 
you know, I get, you a fifty-day average there. Yeah, the fifty-day moving average. Yeah. You know, and obviously the previous peaks on the on the on the move higher. So that's a big level. What's more important, I think, is if we look at the dollar index and we look at a graph. And the reason I'm showing the Bloomberg chart is there's just much more detail to it. This suggests to me that the it's at, a, it's at a real key inflection point here around about this 100 level. It's acted as support Absolutely. there. It's acted as support there. It's been below it. It's now trying to get back above it. So the big question for me, I think, is whether or not um, we can actually break below this 100-day moving average, which is on the dollar index. More importantly, I talked in my weekly video about the importance of dollar Swiss. And the oh, yes. and, and the chart there because there is a decent correlation between dollar Swiss and the dollar index. If I look at this chart here, I can show it to you. Mm -hmm. Look at look at this here again. It's the big big support area through here. Also the the one the two, the 200 day moving average. It's broken below this 9970 area. It's now trying to get back above it, and it's also in a significant downtrend. So. There is some evidence that potentially we're at a very, very key level for the US dollar. If we're to break lower, we need to break below the 200-day moving average on the Swissy, and we also need to break below the 112 level on dollar yen. And yeah. obviously, and, uh, and held overnight. Yeah, which held overnight again. We've made marginal new lows on the dollar yen at 112.10, 120, yeah. you know, around about that sort of level, from 112.55. But more importantly, I think is this dollar Swiss level here because we've been a significant. We've been in a nice little downtrend in the dollar Swiss. We've been in a nice little downtrend in the uh, the dollar index, and it's. I'm just surprised at how well they match up. Okay, the, the moving averages are quite different, but certainly the the trend gradient is actually quite something. So. Yeah, I mean that's pretty steady and solid distribution there. One other thing I was going to mention with Michael on the on the Trump thing is not only is he talking about the currency, but he stopped putting pressure on the Fed to raise rates, hasn't mm. he? He's gone very well, quiet on yeah. that. And I think the I think we're back to looking at uh, well, I'm still at two, and I think you're still at one. I'm so, uh, well, I'm Remember. sort of I'm one and a half. I mean, if you can <laughs> call it that, I'm you know I think we'll definitely get one. Um, but um, we could get two. I think it really depends on what other central banks do, because ultimately I think Mark Carney was very dovish yesterday with respect to his inflation forecasts, and quite frankly I think he's wrong. I think inflation is going to be much more um, of an issue as we head into 2017 than people currently think. So mm -hmm. I get the impression he doesn't want to raise rates, because if he raises rates he might as well, admit, he might as well admit he was wrong to cut them in August. And I don't think he wants to do that. Let's look at, quickly look at the key levels. Even though he was wrong. Well, of course he was wrong. Everyone knows he was wrong. The only one who won't admit yeah. it is him. The big, big. Yeah, the, the, it's a real problem. The big, big levels. S and P 2290. It's held pretty much since we broke below it. We've got a nice little gap there. So between 2290 and 2295, you're going to get a fairly decent bit of um, resistance through there. Decent support around about 2270. I don't think we're going to break significantly above that um, over the course of the next few sessions because I just think given all the rhetoric that's come out of Trump and his cohorts this week I think people are a little bit nervous of a protectionism and a trade war again here 20,000 level on the Dow big big level again will it be will it be resistance on the way back up we gapped lower we haven't been back below it we may well have another go at it um, if, if we get a fairly decent number um, let's quickly look at the the cable because I think this is important. This this 50-day moving average, or sorry, 100-day moving average here. 124.20. And what's 124.20? It's this level here, the blue line, and also these peaks here. That for me, I think, is key. What's worrying me a little bit is we saw a key reversal day yesterday, which could suggest that maybe we'll come back to 122.50. But it's come so close after this key reversal week, the other way suggests that we're probably going to get a bit of a bumpy ride on the pound against the dollar. I still expect the pound to move higher, but we could actually get a very sharp correction lower first towards around about 124. Um, dollar yen, let's quickly look at that. Big, big support as we can see around between 112.05 and 112.10. Big resistance at 114. So I think that's really going to be the extent of it. Yeah. Decent number, decent wage growth. Wage growth, keep an eye on that. I think that's the big one. If we get anything anything in excess of 
2.9 then I think you're going to go and see the, to the dollar go for a bit of a tear and um, that's what we're expecting on the annualized number 0.3 this number here um, on the monthly. The, the monthly number that's not so much of a that's not so much of a number I'm looking at the annualized number and I will now be quiet and we will digest the numbers as they come through so here we go 227. 27. And a 175 upgrade. Right on. Unemployment slightly higher, 4.8. And 2.5. Oh, average hourly earnings, 2.5. 2.5. That is a really weak number on the average hourly earnings. Yep. So that is probably going to it's probably going to move the dollar, the average hourly earnings number, because cable, it's not really done anything. Let's have a look at this. Well, that tells you all you need to know, the really. The dollar index is slipping back yeah, under 100. I, th I think there's a dollar. I think that's a fairly dollar bearish view. I think weak yeah, average hourly yeah. earnings. I think they're going to pay more attention to that than the payrolls number. It was a good payrolls number. Don't get me wrong, 227. But that also suggests to me that there's not an awful lot of slack, or there's more slack in the U.S. labor market than maybe people currently think. So, which is what the Fed was kind of hinting at on Wednesday. They yeah. were, the one thing that struck me about the statement from the Fed was how much they were talking about the uh, inflation and the the lack of inflation. Inflation is below mm. our target. We don't see it getting to our target. A lot. Of, they were they were really dovish on inflation, and this will uh, this will add to the that dovish inflation case at the Fed. Yeah, and I think keep them on hold probably hold probably through mid year. I th well, I mean, to be, to be quite honest, Colin, I, I always thought March was a non a non starter. This pretty much takes yeah. March off the table, I think, and you, you're really sort of talking, you're really sort of talking June at the earliest, I think. Yeah, I thought March was pushing it. The only way you the only way they go in March is if they were serious about four, which I never figured since I've been saying two. So, yeah, I'm with you on this one. It's uh, it's definitely it keeps inflation soft because wage pressures are the sticky ones. That's the one you got to worry about. Commodity prices go up and down. Wages are the one that you, that they, that you got to focus on with the, along with the core inflation. And I th there is another. So yeah, we've got uh, the dollar index is still dropping here. It's yeah. now down to ninety nine nine seventy five and heading lower so that's actually becomes a technical confirmation of 100 as resistance you've, you've had the reversal of polarity 100 with support it's now become resistance so that this is a uh, uh, quite a significant retest here for the uh, for the dollar index and cable what have we got going on with cable? 125 back 20. above 125 for yeah. cable yeah yeah so you know to re to recap let's so let's look let's look at the let's look at the key levels because i think now that the dollar is probably going to weaken i think we're going to get a retest of the the lows so certainly keep an eye on this this dollar swiss chart that i was talking about earlier i think we're probably going to come back down to a test around about 99.20 and 99 um also look at the dollar yen the dollar yen is obviously the big mover that is really the the responsive one in terms wow i mean that pretty much tells you all you need to know so for me i think for for the for this downward momentum to really be maintained we need to stay below this 11320 area that we saw earlier we're getting a little bit of a pullback at the moment but ultimately i think that that wages number has sort of put paid to any potential dollar rebound today and um that's probably going to be reflected i think in my my dollar page here there we go so there we, so the commodity currencies have um, take uh, are obviously taking up the slack a little bit. Um, Australian dollar not altogether surprising. Probably going to see a bit move of a higher in gold prices as a result of that. Let's have a quick look at gold because th that's again near a key resistance level for me on gold. If you have any questions, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to sling them over. More than happy to. Um, so that was a nice little pop on gold there. So there is some resistance around 1218. 1220-ish on the on the upside. Well, if you look but, at uh, yeah, if you look at this here, I mean, you've got a big big level through here, 1220, 1240. So yeah, I think it's ranging gold. Um, we we tested 1180 um, in the early part in the late part of January. We haven't as yet, you know, we haven't been able to get back below that. I don't think this is will be enough to send us through 1220, 1240. 
maybe Peter Navarro will come out and basically spook somebody or spook investors or Donald Trump himself by saying I think the dollar's too high I want it to go lower obviously I don't think he will do that but <laughs> I wouldn't put it past him <laughs> given, some of the, given some of the stuff he's come out with in recent days let's face it threatening to invade Mexico isn't um, <laughs> wouldn't oh be on or wouldn't be top of my list of you know things to you know, make friends and influence people, and then hanging up on the Australian prime or minister. Or inspire confidence. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I couldn't believe they picked a fight with Australia. No, it does seem strange. Well, the stock market yeah. likes the do the likes the numbers, even if the dollar doesn't. So, stock market's retesting that twenty thousand level on the Dow. Be interesting to see whether or not we get back above that. And obviously, again, we'll look at the S and P. We talked about that earlier. Twenty two between twenty two ninety. I. Th I you know, I would doubt that we get back above there, um, but you know I've been wrong before. But um, I'm going to put it out there. I'll be surprised. Be tough. I think it'll be pretty tough to get above there. And actually, if we look um, at the FTSE 100 in particular, I think the FTSE is going to struggle to get back much above 7,200. Yes, it's oversold on the daily RSI's. Let's zoom this in and look at it on a four-hour chart. We can see that through 7200 we've got a series of lows through here and then some peaks through here we have found a little bit of support just below uh, 71 7110 7127 was the previous highs but the thing that makes me doubt that the FTSE has significant upside in it is really this chart here this key reversal week on the FTSE 100 now that would suggest to me that it's going to be very difficult for the FTSE to get much above 7,200. We weren't able to do it last week. We weren't able to do it last week. So the big question for me is, what's going to take us back above there? Certainly on the RSI, we are starting, or the slow stochastic rather, we're starting to roll over. And that weekly reversal there also coincided with the weekly reversal that we saw on cable, on the cable chart. So, mm -hmm. the, you know, the big question for me is what's been the biggest driver of pushing the FTSE up here? It's been sterling weakness. If we no longer have that, then what's going to drive the FTSE 100 higher in the absence of sterling weakness? And yeah, I think you've still got the same relationship between the FTSE, between the FTSE and, and sterling that you've got between the Nikkei and the Yen right now, and they're just basically trading opposite to each other. And I guess dollar, US dollar and gold, but th those are kind of those opposing relationships and I think that's what you're really looking at with the uh, with the FTSE and cable here and with if with cable back above 125 I, I don't see how you're going to get the uh, the FTSE back above 7200 in, in in the near term especially when you're overbought and rolling over yeah I noticed some I think is trying to ask a couple of questions um, you need to reply to the chat that I've just put reply to the chat message that I just sent out a bit, about a minute ago so questions here if you reply to this message here, we can then respond to your question. I, I'm afraid I can't see any other messages unless you actually reply to this message that I've just sent out to everybody here. So, just while we're stopping for a minute, I just wanted to mention, Trevi, we we aren't covering aren't covering uh, Canadian jobs this morning because they're not out this morning. The Canada jobs are out next Friday. This sometimes happens when the first Friday falls in the first couple of days of the. Uh, the month it's not unusual but i just wanted to mention that it's not unusual well, uh, but the cat's been doing a little better it has it happens about three or four times a year anyways i've, I've been asked how would the non-farm figures affect the FTSE 100 they affect the FTSE 100 in terms of the way the dollar reacts um on the exchange rate so um certainly that's the way they that's the way they've been reacting at the moment so if it sends the pound higher it's going to weigh on the FTSE 100 because predominantly that's why the FTSE 100 has been rallying. Um, generally equity markets tend to move in lockstep with each other so what's generally good for one equity market is, is good for the other. So I certainly think there's potential for the FTSE 100 to move higher but I don't think there's potential for it to move much above where we are now so maybe another 20 points. Um, you know, and I think that that for me is how equity markets are affected. Global equity markets are affected by one set of numbers. In this case, 
the non-farm payrolls numbers. It's basically, you know, everything is interlinked. Right, I'm being... Being We're asked. being asked, we see is the next key level of resistance for cable. Well, there's, there's a huge uh, resistance for cable. In intermediate is, is probably a little above 125. I think it was about 125.40. But the huge resistance for cable was in and around where we saw it top out earlier this week in this 127 to 127.30 area. About 127.30, there's actually a, a cluster of, of Fibonacci resistance levels, and that kind of contained the recent... Uh, the recent rally in uh, in cable here just below uh, 127 so what's that first line michael but well if we look at if we look at this we've got a potential double bottom at 120 we've got the mm -hmm. first reaction high which is 127.95 now we've come yeah. all the way back here to around about 124.70 or 120 no 120 yeah 124.30 here so the Basically, the next the next resistance level, minor resistance level, is around about 125.45. If I take this out to a four-hour chart, we can see that there, which is a series of peaks, and that low there. But ultimately, I expect I would expect the pound to try and retest the highs that we saw earlier this week, earlier this week, around about 127, and ultimately retest this peak here from November 127.95 which is also support so it's potentially carving out a base the cable interim resistance around about 125 and a half but ultimately we're looking at 127.95 128 what I wouldn't want to see in the context of this up move is for us to go below 124.20 so hopefully yes, that, that makes sense what I really like about this up move is not only did you have that strong green candle up off the double bottom, but since then, the 50-day the moving average right about 124 has come in as really nice support on these last two weekly candles. And, and that's really encouraging to me that each time you've seen the bears try and pound cable back down, it's getting it's getting contained by the 50-day uh, the, the moving average. It it almost looks like a, a, a cup with, with handle patterns starting to form, but a, which is like a larger... Uh, saucer bottom and then a smaller one starting to, to form here and that could be uh, quite bullish as well for uh, cable in the long term it really does look like there's a pretty big base forming here what we've also got though ladies and gents if you look at the 50 day moving average over the past six months look how often it's acted as support and resistance mm -hmm. so resistance very impressive resistance yeah. resistance a little bit of support broke below resistance resistance support support again so when you see that sort of when you see that sort of sequencing you can't ignore it it's you know it's going to give you a trading signal and ultimately you know if you're looking to play that then it gives you a fairly decent risk reward ratio because essentially what you'd be doing is you're buying the pound as close to that moving average as possible but your stop loss is going to be just below it by you know 30 or 40 points and you know and that really keeps your your stop loss tight while at the same time uh, and minimizing your risk at the same time in the hope of a decent rebound so for me the, de the next key level of resistance on the cable um, f for me at the moment is 125 and a half simply because that was the um, that was the series of peaks that we saw um, earlier this week I'm also being asked, is the 0.2% difference on average earnings a large difference or just classed as a slight difference? Are we talking on the monthly or the... Yeah, we are talking on the monthly. It, it, it is and it isn't. The, 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 the bigger number, which obviously I don't have up here, is the, the annualised number. The annualised number posted a drop from 2.9% to 2.5%. That's a big drop. Everyone was expecting just a modest drop to 2.8. They weren't expecting a big drop down to 2.5. So when you look at it through that sort of prism in terms of what markets were expecting, it's quite a big drop, particularly on an annualized basis. When you consider that inflation is actually rising very, very quickly. So inflation is rising quickly, but wages are stalling out. 
and at the moment central banks will not raise rates if they perceive that wages are not rising in line with inflation because all that will do is exacerbate an income squeeze on those people who are being squeezed by inflation. So hopefully that makes sense. Does anyone else have any other um, questions on any of this? Right, I can see someone's uh, someone else. I'll just highlight here. I think someone else has tried to ask a question, but again, I can't see it. So, um, yeah. I, just, I mm. just wanted to note while we're uh, waiting for questions that we still have some more data coming out uh, in the United States this morning, so we could see some other. Uh, we could other announcements. Uh, the the market service PMI is at 9:45 a.m. That's 2:45 in London. The big one is uh, is three o'clock in London. 10 a.m. here in in uh, in the East uh, Coast is uh, ISM non-manufacturing composite streets expecting 57 and U.S. factory orders street is expecting a rebound to 0.5 percent after a 2.4 percent drop to 2.4 percent drop uh, in last month. Now again, that could have gotten distorted by the holidays, so and 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 so we could get a a rebound in that as well. And we also have the re the rig count at one o'clock this afternoon and and michael was right and something i wanted to mention on the rig count is, is two things one uh, it is increasing as we normally see seasonally but on top of that a couple of weeks ago we had the, we finally had the crossover where drill rigs are running higher than they were in the same week a year ago so we're definitely starting to see that the uh, the the higher oil prices which are, are basically running double what they were this time a year ago is starting to have a positive impact on on spending on exploration and and that's a good thing because those are uh, those are good high paying jobs that uh, that that would be that are going to be starting to come back and help a lot of the uh, US economy in in kind of the middle of the country let's call it that 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 center piece that runs from North Dakota down through uh, through Texas right through the heart of the uh, the United States will uh, will definitely be helpful I've just been asked about dollar turkish lira you're brave whoever you are um, <laughs> yes, it has broken through support, and it looks as if it's going to head lower. Um, so, so certainly on the basis of this four-hour chart that I've got in front of me here, um, certainly a decent break lower. The next area of support is probably quite a little bit lower, um, certainly in the context of that. I must admit it's not something that I'd be particularly brave enough to trade. But uh, yeah, it does look as if it's broken through a fairly key support level on the four-hour chart. Um, been asked about dollar cad colin affected by the oil price okay. yeah of course it is um it is affected by the oil price but ultimately the oil price is not really doing anything at the moment so any move on dollar cad today is likely to be driven by the dollar the us dollar and, and not the oil price though we are seeing oil prices at their at multi-month highs if the oil price does continue to push higher then obviously it will have a double whammy effect on the weakness of the dollar because it will uh, it will cause the Canadian dollar to appreciate. Yeah, and on that on the, on dollar CAD, there's a big support zone for it between 129.75 and 130. 120.79 is a Fibonacci level, and 130 even, of course, is a uh, is a round number. If you break that, and we've seen a couple of times here, here recently, really since uh, since September, as Michael's showing in the chart here, this. This zone is held as support for quite a long time. Now, if you look, though, you've also got a trend of lower highs heading into this. So you've got a really nice ascending triangle that's telling you distribution and that the, that the Canadian dollar has been recovering. So uh, if the oil price and the same thing, we're actually seeing a nice little ascending triangle in the oil price itself showing accumulation. So if the oil price continues to trend upward and eventually breaks out of this uh, 50 to 54 range, it's stuck in on WTI, that would be bullish for CAD. If we start to, and the, the other piece so that we're seeing though with the, the loony is, it is getting a little bit of a boost in that people people are starting to come around to the idea that Trump's probably not going after Canada in uh, in trade talks. I mean, if, if NAFTA goes, we still have a uh, an existing bilateral free trade agreement with the United States that can go back into force because the NAFTA basically built on that anyways. The uh, and, and so basically, although so primarily, I mean, there's, Trump has a lot of other countries in his sights. Even the Mexican peso, to be honest, has rebounded a little bit over the last week or so as as he's kind of started to turn his sights elsewhere uh, away from NAFTA. It looks like he wants to fight a lot of battles at once rather than picking people off one at a time. Which the, is uh, a so dangerous we'll thing to do. That. Could you? 
Yeah, could you put up a dollar Mexican, Michael, just so I can point that out? Sure. The uh, that it actually has been uh, quietly recovering for the last week or two. Uh, you can see there it actually peaked right, right about inauguration day, to be honest, and it's actually been uh, the peso surprisingly has actually been recovered. It surprised me. I thought it would blast through, but it hasn't. It's actually starting to uh, to turn back down. With so with so many things going on. Heading into the inauguration, people were really worried Trump was going to go full force on NAFTA, and that depressed the loony and it depressed the pay. So they've now come off and had a relief rally. Now, I do think that support level there, which is 20 and what, 2040? Anyways, that'll probably contain it. I don't see the peso busting 20. I think, at, 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 for sure, I, I think, or at well, a minimum. Not yet, anyway. Minimum, anyways, I think that that'll kind of contain it for now, just because there's still risk out there of uh, that, that one day he turns around and refocuses on Mexico and that could turn the whole thing right around again so this is likely to be a, a volatile pair to be trading over the next well year at least I think it'll continue to see some, some big swings in a if, lot of if, 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 if Trump lasts that they, long they sort of their relations yeah if Donald Trump lasts that long yeah that too <laughs> all right ladies and gents um, I think um, we're pretty much uh, done for this week as I say um, I have recorded this, so I will be posting it on YouTube at some point over the course of the next um, hour or so. But uh, thank you very much for um, your attendance today. I hope you found um, hope you found our uh, toing and froing useful. And um, please feel free to log in to my weekly webinar, which is on a Monday at 12:15. Otherwise, um, both Colin and myself will see you again same time next month for the February payrolls report. Sounds great. Have a great day trading, everybody.